USDA Farmers Market Promotion Program. The first uh, webinar in this series was in January and it was on understanding uh, your customer base. The second webinar uh, in February was about strengthening the market brand and today's webinar is all about thinking like a retailer. Uh, in order for farmers markets to strengthen their position in the marketplace, uh, we need to recognize that farmers markets have increased competition today. And not only are more markets, there are, not only are there more markets, uh, according to the USDA, is a 3% increase in markets across the country from 2012 to 2013, but there are more CSAs along with more retailers who are vying for that customer who wants to purchase locally produced food. Also, it would seem that we can open markets faster than we can provide farmers to sell at them, which means farmers more or less have their choice of markets. So if we can strengthen our markets, we in turn provide a stable marketplace, which will also attract uh, the best vendors for our markets. So just a little um, housekeeping before I introduce our, our presenter for today. Uh, we will be, have everyone on mute during the presentation today, but I encourage you to type your questions in the questions box. I will be monitoring the question box and uh, we will have time uh, to answer your questions after Eric's presentation. If you have any technical problems, please post them in the chat section so we can address any issues you may be having uh, very quickly. Uh, we have a number of resources uh, that are, I think will be very useful for you. Uh, with today's webinar and uh, a link will be posted in the chat box for you to uh, get those resources. Uh, and Eric's uh, got some really uh, great and useful tool, tools we can use to help improve our markets. Um, the webinar will be posted at the Farmers Market Coalition after today. Um, I'll just tell you a little bit about myself. As I said, my name is Brian Moyer. I am a program assistant with Penn State Extension. I work out of Lehigh, uh, the Lehigh County office in uh, eastern Pennsylvania, southeastern Pennsylvania, so I work primarily in southeastern Pennsylvania. I assist farmers who sell direct to consumers with marketing and regulations. Uh, I also work with farmers markets and on-farm markets. Uh, my wife Holly and I have a small grass-based livestock operation in Berks County, and uh, I was also a market manager myself for 10 years. And now let me uh, introduce you to uh, Eric Barrett. Uh, Eric, I had the good fortune to meet Eric uh, about two years ago on a bus tour. Uh, we were doing uh, Penn State Extension and Ohio Extension in uh, western Pennsylvania and eastern Ohio where we were visiting uh, farm markets in those regions. Uh, Eric is an Ohio State University Extension educator located in northeast Ohio. He specializes in direct marketing and local foods. Teaching is his passion and he regularly presents at state and national conferences anywhere from Nashville to Kansas City and from Las Vegas to Portland. Eric grew up on his family's dairy farm where his family still raises grass-fed beef, grows pumpkins and berries and teaches the public through agritourism activity. So Eric, take it away. All right, good afternoon. So glad to be with everyone today. We'll get my screen shared here. Give us just a second to switch over. There we go. Okay. Everyone should be able to see my slide now. We're good, Brian? Yep, we're good. Okay. Excellent. Okay. Uh, the first thing here I wanted to just chat about for a couple seconds, uh, the webinars are recorded and they're online. If you haven't watched last month's webinar uh, or you want to show part of that to your farmer's market vendors, please do so. That was an excellent webinar and it gives folks a great background as to what we're really talking about when we get into retailing. That brand is the start of that visual identity. It's how customers see the market. It's how vendors that might want to sell your market see your market. It determines your future. One great example there is the Easton Farmers Market in Ohio. You can look this up. Uh, just make sure you use Easton Farmers Market Columbus, Ohio. There is a different Easton Market. Heidi is one of the market managers there, and she does an excellent job keeping that moving along. 
Our mission today that we'll talk about and go through in detail with you is to give you that edge in the marketplace. We want to go on beyond what you thought about as a brand and look at everything you see in the market. For example, that picture on the left, that is from the Eastern market. We want to know, is it wide enough for customers? Are we seeing customers trip over each other? Uh, it does look beautiful, but think about everything that we see in that picture really analyzing our own markets and our competition to make us rethink what we're doing versus everything we miss. Uh, this photo on the right, uh, I won't tell you where it's from, uh, but it looks like somebody's frustrated. And they were frustrated because mom really is paying attention to samples. So uh, we just want to make sure that, that vendors maybe know that this happens once in a while and, and say, you know, boy, this, this looks good. It's glad you're doing the samples, but make sure you don't spend too much time on it. Uh, to just look at what we miss because customers see that. Okay, retailing 101. What are we really talking about? A lot of us shop every day, right? Whether it's grocery shopping or clothes shopping or car shopping. We are out there and we're consumers. So let's use that consumer aspect that we're used to of shopping to look at what retailing is. For example, look at these two farmers market stands. Uh, one is in one state and one's in another, so they're pretty far apart. But I ask the question, is your shopping experience up to par with today's marketplace? Let's compare that photo on the left to start out with. Uh, looks like some decent produce, uh, but the table is very dirty. So we know the person's probably not following good agricultural practices and produce safety rules that we're looking at. Uh, kind of mixed up. Uh, there's some burlap there, not as pretty. The boxes look like they've been reused a few times. Versus on the right, we look at a very clean, like a white cloth on top of the table, probably plastic, to uh, they can wipe it off real fast. And then very full displays, signage on each product item, tells what that item is, a little logo of the farm, it's kind of small, you can't quite see it, a price written on there with a, um, a China marker, and then how to use that product. If you were able to see that in person, you'd see long beans, and here's how to use them, here's how to cook with them, here's how you might eat those all the things we really need to do with our products. The next slide here, the big guys are copying us. I took this photo at Giant Eagle Marketplace in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. A lot of you shop at whether it's Whole Foods or any other store that's trying to compete on the local trend. We've got to check them out. Look at this. They, they were able to pull up a sign that looks very much like something we might have at a farm stand or a farmer's market. It has details of bib lettuce. It's a soft leaf lettuce packed full of flavor. It's a perfect ingredient for a tossed salad. That's some stuff that maybe some of our vendors are, are lacking, but a shopper that might love our market goes to Giant Eagle Marketplace and says, oh, this is the same thing. They're buying from local farmers, and look, they tell me how to use product. So our competition is really copying some of our things we're doing at farmer's markets and that look of a farmer's market. Make sure we check them out and make sure we continue to differentiate ourselves from what they're actually doing at these places. Make sure we're visiting them on a regular basis and we'll give you a little homework assignment on how to visit them and then make the best notes possible to help your market out. On to some retail trends. So these are the real things we need to look at in general to make sure that we're keeping up to par. Uh, as much as we think, well, we're maybe not as trendy in certain areas, our consumers are. The ones that want to shop with us are very trendy. So we need to look at what's happening out there on all fronts. The first one, social media rules. Pinterest and Twitter, those two places, and now even Facebook a little bit, recipes have gone wild. Probably some of us are a little annoyed by those sometimes, uh, but my mom's one that just absolutely loves it. She's posting recipes all the time. A couple of my wife's, my wife's friends uh, are out there, and they're like, oh, did you see we had this banana recipe, and there's only three ingredients in the whole thing. It's really easy to make. The only thing about this photo of this banana oatmeal chocolate chip cookie thing is who made it. If we, if we put recipes on for farmers markets and follow this kind of trend, we need to have our logo. We need to brand this. We need to change the colors around. This is well done. It goes through steps and has photos, but it's not branded. So if we do use social media a lot, whether it's this or it's a photo we post, we need to worry about the, the branding part, whether it's a, a line around the edge of the photo, whether it's a watermark of our logo on the picture. Make sure that if that picture is shared, people will know it's from our market. Next, technology rules. Everybody has a smartphone. All of our consumers do. 
they're using that constantly. How can we get into that smartphone? And we don't want to be tracking them, maybe like Google or Apple, but how can we get an app on there? How can we do things like text our customers? Uh, how can we get them to follow us on Twitter? Anything else we can do that we're going to get on their phone because it's with them at all times. The next one, try here, buy online. Now a lot of times we see this in a different kind of retail setting like a Target or a Walmart or any other kind of a fashion retailer. Uh, my niece is looking for a prom dress, for example. She tried it on one place, she bought it online for like half that much. It's a big trend out there that people are using those stores and then buying somewhere else. Some of these retail outlets are using that to say you can try it on here, we have these sizes, but you actually buy it online. So they're doing it a little bit different. But what you might be able to do is look at what, what this means for you in the marketplace. So if you're only open on Saturdays, they might love your product. You know, I bought these tomatoes there, they were great. Well, by Tuesday afternoon, that person's out of tomatoes. What do they do? They have to wait till Saturday, till Saturday to find you again. So can we take this trend and go into a uh, maybe different day market, but maybe our vendors don't want to do that. Can we send them to another market? Can we figure out how online to say we're going to have a pickup place uh, halfway through market week for folks to get some of our products when we're not open? The next one, relationship marketing. The old new customers are too expensive. So we've built this great relationship with folks. We want to keep them buying as much as possible. Try to understand why they like you why maybe they should, should like you if they don't like you yet, and how you can keep them engaged. And we'll talk about this in detail, but basically we can't quit during the winter. Even if our market closes, we need to keep that relationship moving through the winter months. Finally there, entertainment. Uh, have something interactive. Make sure it's not necessarily a band or a clown. You don't have to have that, but entertainment is important. What can you do to keep some folks engaged? On the right here, at Easton Farmer's Market, they had this watermelon carving. You could do something like this. Uh, you could use pumpkin carving kits that have the knives that don't cut people. And kids can be involved, depending on your target market. And you could use this to really try to engage some folks at your market. Next is some food trends to really look at that I think impact our market significantly. It's this convenience factor, snacking. Convenience things I've already seen out there is something like a salsa kit. And uh, using words like it comes in its own natural packaging, it's edible. Uh, over here on the right, in the bottom right, fruit, the original fast food. Try some today. Any kind of thing to use words that people are like, oh, I don't we'll have to wait and get a bag of chips after I leave the market. I can eat that fresh piece of fruit. They just don't think about it. They might think about it later, but just keep putting little words into their mind to say, hey, you can do this. Another word on that salsa kit, we'll, we'll talk when we get to one of, the, um, one of the case studies here in just a minute, but try to think of products they can buy together, bundling things. The next trend, the second bullet, healthfulness. We've got them here, right? We have a healthy product. We promote whether it's organic or sustainably raised or conventionally raised, but we reduce our pesticide use. Whatever it is, make sure we're promoting that healthfulness, and we'll go through some nutrition ideas for you later today. Local. Uh, local is almost becoming a fad. It's hard to say. It's, it's definitely still pushing along. It's definitely growing, but we're seeing local used in Walmart. Uh, it's out there. They're putting, here's this farmer that we are buying from. I'm not sure that that is working in that location because uh, people can understand that, and it comes back to some authenticity we'll talk about. So make sure you're promoting the food, not just the food, but the farmer, how far it traveled to get, the, to get there, and then also promoting the other local aspect of farmer's markets. So what else is local around there? use, you know, here's the small businesses we partner with or the small businesses you can shop at after the market closes. The next one, the fourth bullet, men are shopping more for groceries. Uh, if you go into a grocery store today, try this out, go to Giant Eagle Marketplace or Whole Foods and watch how many men are doing grocery shopping versus women. This is a big, quick change that we're seeing in the marketplace. How, what does that mean for your market? How are men different from the women we're used to? And finally, the last one, baby boomers. Those are still a lot of our clients at farmers markets. We now can say that they're going to be half of food dollars spent by next year. That's significant. 
what, what does that say about the very first trend we looked at, convenience and snacking, right? Those portion sizes, uh, look at the, the corn sign we have on the top right. Do people really buy a dozen as much anymore? I would say we're almost all moving to uh, buying by the ear when it comes to corn. We can think of that in lots of different products we sell, and that goes into our next slide. On the left, yummy peppers, right? It looks like lots of different colors. It, it's something maybe we can snack on and eat and give some ideas. We need to show our vendors some things they might be able to do. Do show and tell at your vendor meetings to help improve this marketing, this image, this retail establishment you have. Make snacking or snack a common word that they use in their displays and at their stands. And then look at this salad sampler, 350, which I might charge more than that, but look, we have lots of different tomatoes. Maybe those tomatoes can be used for different things throughout, throughout the next couple of days that they're buying that and using it. So try to combine things in the packaging to make it simpler for these folks to use. Get lots of ideas. We still have an edge when it comes to trends that we're farmers. We're very authentic. This is a great book. If you haven't read it, I strongly encourage you to look at it since you are involved in retail agriculture. Uh, authenticity. These are the authors, uh, Pine and Gilmore, of the experience economy. It's what a lot of folks use to really drive uh, agritourism and to drive the beginning of this farmer's market craze several years ago that's really going well. That was an awesome book. It was ahead of its time. This one is even further ahead. It's been out a couple years, but it's really meeting today's needs in retailing. When we talk about authenticity, we talk about you can actually talk to the farmer. You don't have to have just a sign that says this is local. You can talk to the person that raised this product. Folks can ask how this was grown. Some of the challenges that other retailers have is that they're not meeting this authenticity part. Uh, for example, you'll see the McDonald's commercial right now. It talks about these fresh baked petite pastries. Well, what does fresh baked mean? Fresh baked me it really means it's a frozen product and they're baking it at the store. So it's, a, it's something that a lot of bigger retailers can't be as authentic as we are. So we need to look at that and capitalize on it. Next, looking at our competition. Here's four different examples uh, I'd like you to look at. If you can, you can Google these or go around your town or your area and see who the competition really is. Let's start on the top right with Whole Foods. We look at that picture and we think, Gosh, this looks like a farmer's market. They have the bins, they have them at different heights, they have great looking displays. They're really copying what we're doing. When you walk in the door, what does it look like inside? Something to think about. On the bottom right, we look at this. This is a form of hypersourcing. So they're growing uh, these plants, this lettuce, right here in Giant Eagle Marketplace. Are folks buying that? Is it, is it catching on? Uh, what's it teaching folks about food production? Very neat. On the bottom left, this is just an example of a CSA called Grow Youngstown. I encourage you to really look at CSAs in your area because they are your competition. What are they doing? Are you losing vendors to those CSAs because it's easier for folks to just say, uh, oh, they have 500 uh, subscriptions to their CSA. I'll just give my product or sell it to them. I don't have to go to the market every week. Look at what CSAs are doing and are they lasting all year? What's happening in that direction? Top left, Local Roots. This is an awesome market and cafe in Wooster, Ohio. Uh, it's really done a good job of taking farmers to really understand season extension, that we have clientele 12 months out of the year. What can we sell them? So it's really expanded some meat, opportunities, egg, other products that, that farmers can sell throughout the growing season. Next slide there, what are these, these competitors using? What are the big guys using? Farm stand, their display that we just saw at, at uh, Whole Foods, looks like it's a farmer's market. That giant eagle place looks like hyper-local sourcing, that they're growing their own lettuce in the store and then selling it from there. They have a lot of other things on us sometimes, but we can compete. Constant connections with customers. They have staff doing social media all the time. They have sampling events. They have their logo on their bags. And then there's SNS Produce out of Goshen, New York. We're starting to do that. My only concern there is make sure you tell folks they need to wash those and they bring them back to the market. 
the next bullet, sales tactic, tactics. Uh, they're doing lots of customer loyalty programs. You know, Giant Eagle, you run that card through and you get those gas points. What are some things we can do? They do incentives. Buy this, get that. Uh, they also have sales. And a lot of us are real leery about having a sale, but a sale doesn't mean you have to give something away. Use the dopamine kind of example that, you know, it's just so exciting. J.C. Penney's the, the biggest example lately. We're just going to cut costs and treat everybody the same. And their customer said, no, we want the dopamine. We want the sale. So they had to actually raise a lot of prices to be able to offer those sales again. So think about a sale we could do without spending money. So if you look at the end cap in maybe a grocery store, uh, the sign could say it's two for $10. Well, the cost is $5, right? But when the customer sees two for 10, they think, oh, I'm going to buy two, which gives you more sales, and they think they're getting a deal. So not saying trick your customers, but use some marketing tactics to help people think, oh, gosh, this is great. I got some dopamine. I feel like I really got a good deal because you're giving them an awesome product that's grown locally. It's a great benefit for them. The last one there, why is it working? For them, for our bigger competitors, the location's working, the convenience that they're open, open many hours and many days of the week, and that they already have that brand image that they're using. So the activity that I want you to go through, and this is on page four of the handout link uh, that's there in the chat box, uh, or was a little bit ago, but you can, oh, it still is. You can click on that and you can download. Uh, there's nine pages of information with today's program. So page four of this handout is this uh, retail image sheet that you can use to measure the competition. It has a number two on the bottom of the page. I'll give you just an example. I filled one of these out for Whole Foods. I visited in Cleveland just a couple weeks ago to uh, kind of practice for today. On the left-hand side of your screen, the first wow, these are the questions that are on that sheet for you to fill out. So my answer to that one was, wow, it looks like a farmer's market. It's very cool. The first next line, first thing I see when I go inside, I see produce, produce, and lots of unique produce. So it wasn't just lettuce. It wasn't just this or that. There was lots of different kinds of produce. Now, there wasn't a ton of the very unique things, but it was enough that they're getting sales from that and they're dragging me in the door by, oh gosh, I know they have unique things. Third thing, logo appearances. I saw the logo on every sign. I saw the logo on every pricing sticker, uh, even on the napkins when they had some samples. The fourth line down, the first friendly hello. The produce stock person said hello to me when they saw me come in the door. And they were still working, their hands were still moving, but it was that smile that they really try to engage when you walk in the door. We hope that our folks do that and every one of our vendors do that. Next, what are the employees wearing? They're all wearing aprons that were solid colors and it has the logo right on the apron. What are we doing at our farmer's market to meet that? Next line, the prices are visible and they have some kind of a sale going on. And the reason I put this on there is that our consumers at farmers markets are not necessarily price conscious. They're not going to spend a ton of money on a product, like three or four times what they might spend at a Whole Foods or a grocery store, but they might spend a little more with us. So we really need to look at putting prices right out in front of folks. Uh, they don't want to guess on these things and they're really not price conscious, so it doesn't matter, but they just want to know how much it is. So they all the prices there in Whole Foods, clearly marked prices, and yes, there were items on sale. Displays, they were bright, they were colorful, they were always full, uh, so they're checking them and making sure they're filled all the time, and they had awesome uh, farmer bios by a lot of the different products. So we got this locally, and there's the person that raised it, and here's their website. Next, bundled items. So this is the salsa we talked about earlier. They had two things. They had a holiday table, uh, and this is actually not from two weeks ago. It was when I was there in December. They had a holiday table that had different flowers for centerpieces, and they could pick out, folks could pick out, and a couple sample um, bouquets they could put together. They had different food items that they could use for their holiday table and coffee. So it was, oh, this table sitting there, it's got this tablecloth over it, and it has this centerpiece, and it had, it's set up. So it, it gave those, those customers the idea of, wow, I could set up my holiday table, and I could buy three or four things or more from this display. The other bundled item they had two weeks ago was, it didn't even say guacamole on it, but it had avocados, tomatoes, cilantro, and different kinds of onion all over this one little, like, maybe six-by-six-foot section.
And so when I walk up to that, I think, oh, I have all the stuff right here. I'm going to make guacamole. If you just walk through a produce aisle, you might not think about making a product, but since that was there, it gives customers a big idea of, I can make guacamole. Next, the most memorable part of my visit, it was all the unique items, all the unique produce items that were there, the vastness of what was available, so it wasn't just a huge display of corn. It wasn't just a huge display of all these peppers. It was many different items, and we'll catch this later in the presentation of how you can make sure you're getting that with the gap analysis. And finally there at the end, the most memorable item for me was blood oranges, something I just hadn't seen in a while. But it's not that easy. It's not just looking at our competitors. It's not emulating them. It's being ourselves. It's looking at our competition and say we're more than that. We have dirty farm hands. Uh, this was a book I saw at a New York farmer's market. I thought this was great to show the authenticity that we are farmers. We're the ones raising this product. Encourage your farmers to push this, that they are the producer. Now let's hit some product ideas for retailing. What are you really selling? Uh, this is a, a picture from a farm market just north of Pittsburgh. What are they selling? Looks like apples, right? They're selling quarter pecks, half pecks, and a whole peck bag. Prices are right there in front. That's pretty good. But is that really what they're selling? Well, let's go back to everything most of us buy, unless you guess you live in Manhattan and you can use the subway. Uh, why do people buy cars? You might assume that people do it for safety. They do it to get somewhere, right? They know they want to go. They want to be able to drive to work, to drive the kids somewhere. Uh, they don't want to be towed like this guy is, so just enough to get around, right? But the reality, or the really, is they want satisfaction. They want to feel good about their vehicle. They maybe want a status symbol that they want to show folks that, hey, I'm out there. I've got my Mercedes now. They want speed. Maybe it's a hobby for them. They want style. Or if it's some of our moms in that 25 to 44 age range we're looking at, it's cup holders. You'd be amazed at the research that goes into how many cup holders go into a minivan. So there's lots of reasons they really buy cars. They're not really looking at a car. They're looking at all these other things. So let's go back to that example. They're really selling what? A family business. They're selling we're local. They're selling goodness. Look at this, their t-shirt at Sorgles. It's S-O-E-R-G-E-L-S dot com. A great farm market. They're good to the core. So adding that play on words and saying we're wholesome, well, these are all the things we're really selling as us as a family business. Because they can go anywhere and eat these days and get local food, but make sure they're coming to us for a reason. What else in product? I want to really, really emphasize that we need to look at nutrition facts for the products we sell. Uh, I like here on the picture on the left, eat your colors, summer vegetables, three for $2. Well, that is a USDA promotion program, right, for vegetables. It's a color, but most of the customers we serve don't know that. They don't, that doesn't really speak to them. But maybe something like a nutrition fact or pulling something off a label like this and putting on that sign would make a difference. Uh, are we telling people how wholesome this is because it's local, that it tastes different because it's local? And this is from nutritiondata.com, and there's lots more information besides just this regular nutrition label on that website. So that leads us into quality and direct marketing. Uh, this is one of my favorite signs on quality here. It's the peaches. Homegrown on our farm, our peaches are firm. They need one to two days to soften on your counter to be sweetest and juiciest. They will bruise, so be careful while you shop. We're telling folks exactly what to do with this product. So they're not biting into it and thinking, gosh, this peach was kind of hard. It wasn't that good. We don't want consumers to think that. But we also don't want the very ripest peach to be there because it's going to get bruised. It's going to be maybe a little soft and they push their finger into it. And then they'll be like, oh, that, that's overripe or that's, that's not the product I really want. So tell them what that product is and how to use it, how to eat it. Uh, going through the bullets there, varieties are different. So there's a huge difference between uh, a local market that's fresh versus somebody that's buying a processing variety, and some of our vendors don't realize that, especially if they're newer, that quality is different. Vendors must grow what the consumer wants. So they might want heirloom, but they also want perfection. Uh, we need to look at what we can do about cracking in some of our heirloom tomatoes, and there's information on that out there of how to pick properly and look at those issues. 
How do customers use the product, like our peaches? Can we tell them? Can we tell them why it tastes better? For example, uh, this is a, a quote from about tomatoes. It's from Witten Farm Markets. They're in southeast Ohio. They have about 22 market stands. They went from tons and tons of different vegetables are growing to less than 20. And they really only direct market. They do wholesale a little bit of sweet corn. That's what they're really known for. But these tomatoes, how do we get folks to buy more tomatoes? So she looked into, her name is Julie, how can I get folks to understand how awesome our tomatoes taste? She figured out through some researching different sites that if you sprinkle salt, drizzle a little bit of oil, and refrigerate them for 30 minutes, they taste amazing. So she did that, did it for her employees. You can do this for the folks that are vendors at your market. Take the same two tomatoes, one just cut up and leave it room temperature and serve immediately. The other, prepare it 30 minutes before that, sprinkle a salt, drizzle a little oil, put it in the refrigerator for those 30 minutes, and have folks compare. Which one tastes better and why? Do people understand how to eat our products? Uh, there's some good information if you're interested in that taste idea even more. Uh, the website there at the bottom, go.osu.edu slash produce quality. You'll see uh, one of our researchers that likes marketing, uh, his name is Matt Kleinhens. He has done a lot of research into bricks, which is a measure of sugar to show what products really have a higher quality level. Next, look at that product mix. You know, if everybody has sweet corn, we're not going to have a lot of customers. We're also going to have vendors that are going to start arguing that instead of $6, well, I haven't sold any yet, and it's already 10 a.m., so I'm going to drop my price to 5 uh, Some of us have rules against that. Um, how much we can enforce those rules, I'm not sure. Uh, a lot of legal challenges there, uh, here and there, about those questions, but what's that product mix that we have? We need to perform a gap analysis, and by that, I don't mean good agricultural practices. I mean, where are those holes in our market? This is from the Athens Farmers Market, one of the oldest markets in the country in Athens, Ohio. And they have a, a much detail on their gap analysis. And if you look at that red circle there, it says, for example, list heirloom tomato and then striped German. They're getting that much detail out of vendors about what products are going to be at their market. So they will know where are the holes, what, farmer, what farmers do we need to invite or find that are selling products in those holes. On the next page, and there's a sample of this that you can use, it's on page 7 of the handout today. Uh, if you send me an email, I can also send you a Word version, so you can actually just retype into this, or you can just create your own, either way. We must set limits but we need to know where to set those limits. On this example, look, everybody has sweet corn. So how do we choose one sweet corn grower over another? We might look at, well, we only have four market stalls extra right now, and if these are our new applicants for the year, we might choose the people that are filling in uh, the stone fruit and the pome fruit holes there, that we need you know, peaches in that stone fruit column, or pome fruit if there was someone there, those apples and pears. Maybe this XYZ farm has a value-added product that we don't have selling at the market, and that fills a hole. Make a chart like this for all your vendors and figure out what products you don't have, and try to recruit farmers selling those products. We also need to look at full-time farmers versus seasonal farmers versus part-time farmers. So what are they growing? Are they only going to come to us in the fall with pumpkins? Are they only going to come in the spring with lettuce? Are they going to show up again in the fall with the same lettuce? What kind of farmer are they? Are they going to be here multiple times of the year or all year or just sometimes? So where are the opportunities or the holes in this chart that you can fill in? Seasonality. This is a big challenge with farmers markets, especially if you're not open in winter. So our grocery stores, right? They're not seasonal. They provided that convenience for a lot of our customers that we'd like to have. Have CSAs eliminated seasons? A lot of them have because of hoop, uh, hoop houses, high tunnels, any of those things are able to grow all year round. I actually have a couple farms that work with Matt Kleinhens here at Ohio State that they have decided they're taking the rat race of the summer off. They're only using their hoop houses and they take off the months of June, July, and August, start back up in September, they grow all kinds of greens and different products in those hoop houses and they make a lot higher profit in that winter time. That high tunnel, make sure you're looking at it, having your vendors look at it, maybe even hosting a workshop to help those growers look, in, look into some season extension. 
The last one there, you must engage all winter. This photo is uh, from the Facebook page of the Eastern Farmers Market in Ohio. They're just kind of adding that little St. Patrick's Day flair and showing people that they're still there. And they talk in this post, I think, about eggs. You know, can still get eggs at our market. You must engage all winter. Have something like the recipe of the week. Have a local partner of the week. Talk about keeping local or staying local during the winter time. Uh, look at cooperative ordering. Maybe you can order something from uh, a CSA that's a couple hours away and you're delivering that and having a pickup point in your area. Whatever you want to do. Farmer profiles would be great during the winter when farmers have a little more time saying, you know, this is Joe Farmer. This is his farm in the winter time. This is what he's doing. Keep your customers engaged during the winter. It's too expensive to get new customers every season. Here is a uh, farm market, not a farmer's market, but a farm market that's open year-round. And it's really challenging during the winter, especially here in Ohio. It's, it's been a, a lot of cold weather and a lot of snow. So you can look it up, whitehousefruitfarm.com. One of the things they do is really highlight Bonnie the dog. On the Facebook page, they actually have a birthday party for her, uh, and they get donations at their farm to help with the cause that go to uh, the pet shelter. So Bonnie's place on there, you can click on it, and there's coloring pages. You might think about something like that. Is there something else that happens in the market? It might not be a pet at the farm market because we don't really want one at the farmer's market with fresh produce. But look what you can do. There's tons of ideas to make sure that we're focusing on year-round. On to customer focus. Look at these. We're used to women 25 to 44, right, and some boomers. That's most of our, our clientele. But we're looking at this fuzzy picture here saying, is this really true? Are we only seeing those folks? We're noticing more men. If we really look at our markets, we're seeing that trend nationally. We're also seeing it farmer's market. Understand what their preferences are. Do they like a certain time of day? Do they have their children with them when they're there? Are they in a hurry? What are we doing to meet their needs? If it's women 25 to 44, why do we only have Saturday morning markets? Uh, I've had several moms tell me, I can't go to the farmer's market because I got soccer games. They, my, soccer moms can't go to the farmer's market. So do we have an extended hours, like maybe till two for them? Uh, do we have other nights of the week, other ways we can meet their needs? Why are our customers coming? They have a preconceived concept of our market, and we must continue to meet and exceed those expectations of those customers through that retail image. So delightment. This lady at this farmer's market, this was in Manhattan, loved, she was a big foodie. She loved being delighted with a new tomato variety every few weeks. And that doesn't mean you have to have a ton of a certain uh, variety of tomato, but if you look at this photo, there's just four little containers of these yellow tomatoes. That made a difference for her that day. So think about the foodies that are looking for that just little extra bit of delightment and meet that delightment. Be careful, though, of a carnival-type atmosphere. We don't want to be too delighting that we're turning away some of our foodie customers. Next, they feel important. Make sure you continue to make them feel important with a genuine welcome. That's why that's one of the questions in your, in your handout for your homework. We're asking, hey, welcome. We're so glad you came today. I know it's misting, but our farmers still have produce, whether it's raining or not. Make sure you have convenient parking. Make sure they have a thank you after the sale and even a thank you when they're getting into the parking lot. Go beyond the product and offer those extra things. Why are our customers staying? Why are they returning? Uh, they're staying because of these kind of things and returning. Keith's Farm tomatoes, organically grown, vine ripened, picked yesterday. And he offers you to taste the difference. What a great thing, just promoting as a retailer, here's three reasons my product is better than something else you can find. Creating loyalty through those kind of signs. You're reminding them throughout the market with clipboards to have sign-ups. Uh, there's a great app called group.me, and there's other ones out there that you can text your customers with. Social media, offering business cards and bags all the time. Anything to get them to come back or go to your website to get them to follow you on Twitter, to get them to follow you on Facebook. And even refrigerator magnets, which is kind of old school marketing, but the refrigerator is where we want to be, right? We want to be there because when they're out of something and they shut the door, oh, the farmer's market's tomorrow morning, they're going to come. Make sure we're building that brand with constant communication through all those outlets.
Here is a great one that's on the Farmers Coalition, Farmers Market Coalition website. It's called farmfanapp.com. Uh, it's a really neat new um, app that you can use. It's to gain customer loyalty. Customers will get points. Uh, they will also, you'll also be able to text them through this and tell them what's going on at the market. It, it's just a really neat application. And it looks like the, on this uh, drawing that the dog can actually do the uh, app for you. <laughs> Prices start at $38 a month when you go on the actual website to look at it. Some of you might think, wow, $38 a month is maybe a little more expensive. But if you look, it really can make a difference. Uh, we, can, we can look at, gosh, you know, I can, I can have loyalty points for these folks. One of the folks using it in Pittsburgh actually said once folks get to 500, there's a free local food meal at his farm at the end of the season. The market might join in and say, everybody that uses this app, we're going to do that as a group. Some other options for markets or farmers, uh, research apps and see what's out there, what's worth the price, what can I do. Know the challenges of those apps before you actually implement it, and do a trial on whichever one you pick out. Make sure you're connecting with customers in general. Maybe some, some cheaper options for you to collect cell phone numbers so you can text folks. They will write it down. Uh, some people aren't as limited on minutes as they used to be. Make sure we're collecting emails, especially that boomer crowd. They'd rather do that. They, they're a little worried about their cell number sometimes. Look at Twitter hashtags for your market. You know, are we using hashtag my farmer's market, hashtag Easton farmer's market? Whatever that is, make it simple and make sure all your vendors are using that and then even using that on Facebook because it's becoming more of a trend. Define your own rewards. This Ronnie Book Farm Dairy here on the right had a great open house. You come out to the farm, you can buy different products, you can see what's actually happening, how the products are being grown. Looking into this also on site and layout. What does your market layout look like? Is it set up just so a truck can back in and you can sell it on the back of the truck? This layout is for the part of the delightment. You want people to be able to see a great, awesome entrance. You want it to be really obvious of where they go into the market. Make it really convenient for them. It keeps their mind on purchasing rather than that little comment that says, gosh, I had a hard time getting through between the trucks. They are always asking, um, where am I? Where are you in the market? Make sure you think about things like other retailers, like the mall that has a sign, where am I? It has a map of the operation there at the mall, and there's a little star, you are here. We should be using those kind of things in our markets, just like the big retailers are. This uh, complete site and layout, uh, here's a couple more ideas for you. Think about how customers move. Most of the time it is to the right. A lot of folks will change their market based on that. Think about your natural tendencies when you go look at the competition. Do you go to the right? Do you go towards your interest? Uh, if that's awesome tomato over there, I'm going to go right there when I drive in. Also think about, as a market manager, what is the best spot? And can you charge more for that vendor that takes the best spot? I know there's a lot of politics sometimes in markets that you couldn't do that, but it's kind of like a slotting fee that the average woman is somewhere around 5, 2 to 5, 4 from the grocery store. Everything at that eye level, they charge a, a more expensive slotting fee for companies to put products there. So think about that. We probably could in some instances. And then maybe there are some bad vendor spots that are, that are way out of the way or we have so many vendors we're putting them in back now. Uh, maybe we don't charge as much for those spaces. As a farmer's market, you are agile. You can try something different. You can always come back if you change something and it doesn't work. So take a look at that. Uh, if you notice that today's show has a new uh, big arch looking like a sun, you can see it anywhere you are around there, whether it's TV or you're walking around Manhattan, that it's very obvious that's where that location is. Think about something that you can do to make your entrance very obvious. Putting it all together, uh, we have homework assignments for you from today to really look at your e retail image. So we want you to go beyond your competition on that handout we talked about earlier, and this one starts on page three, to really look at your market. So there's instructions uh, on the page before that that tells you how to do this, how to get customers, vendors to look at different things, and to really say, this is what our market's about, these are the problems we might have or the real pluses that we have that we need to even capture more. 
Rome wasn't built in a day, so you can't write down every potential challenge or every potential thing you might do. Uh, try one, two, three at a time at the most and look at what am I going to do now to improve my market. That's on page six at the end of the handout for that section. So take a look at what you can actually do to make your market better based on those worksheets that you have folks help you fill out. There's some great resources there. These are on pages eight and nine. And they're also on the Farmers Market Coalition site. It's more information from me. It's some summaries of a lot of the markets we've visited across the country. The first is the top 10 attributes of the best farmers markets. So this is really for market managers to say, what do you really need to be offering farmers? Uh, or what is a farmer going to look at when they come and choose your market to sell? So it goes through a whole list of here's some great things you can do to make sure that you're doing a good job. The bottom is the top 10 strategies for farmers market vendors. So it's what we want to, we think the best vendors do to make good sales. You can see the first one there, telling your farm story. That's a big part of what we need to do is say we're authentic and here's what we do on our farm, how we grow things. Uh, we'll take some questions now. Thank you very much. We appreciate, I appreciate being with you today. You can also follow our team blog. We post lots of different stories and ideas and presentations on there. It's at u.osu.edu. Okay, Brian, we'll get some questions coming in. Are you there, Brian? Hello? There Hello? we go. Now we can hear you. Okay, I see a question down there at the bottom. It says, uh, what about catering uh, to the mother and child audience for promoting farmers markets? Uh, yeah, if that's your customer base, uh, think about what you can do. I, I've seen a couple markets that have um, the same thing. If you've been to Giant Eagle, it's like a little fenced-in area. It's got a couple, maybe 4-H teens there or something, uh, and they, they have a way of coding the child and the adult. They'll watch the kids, and they can uh, color in there while mom shops around. Um, one of the things at Whole Foods that one of the folks was telling us is that they gave you a banana when you walked in the door. And so the child is more engaged in eating that banana and acting good while you pick out produce. So anything uh, that you can do to cater to that mom audience, you might think about strollers. Are strollers easy to go in and out of your market? Are they have to cl having to climb a curb to get in there? Seems kind of a thing if we have any uh, handicap challenge folks coming to our market. Can they get in and out with ease? Maybe you want to look at the parking lot. Do we have parking for expecting mothers, parking for moms with toddlers, things like that. Well, I guess we are having some sound issues, so I will go through these questions for you. Um, can you hear me, Eric? Yes, I can. Okay. Um, what was the website that you mentioned about the nutrition information? Nutritiondata.org. Okay, great. And that's to create those labels? Those labels are already created on that site for you, so okay. you can print them out, uh, you can resize them. Yeah, oh, I'm sorry, it's nutritiondata.com. And there's also more information than just that standard nutrition label that our customers are used to reading. It has more details about vitamins and minerals, way beyond what that nutrition, label, nutrition facts label I showed you. You can get a lot of detailed information from that site and use those at your market. Uh, it'd be nice if we can get a, even a better resource to use in markets, but it doesn't exist at this point in time. Great. Hello. Hello. Can you hear Hi, me Brian. now? Hi, yes. Brian. I'm sorry. I'm, I, my mic keeps cutting out. I apologize. Um, 
there was one the one qu question uh, here that just came in says uh, it's, can you suggest strategies for educating vendors about best practices it's difficult to gather our vendors during the busy market season pre-season and tend only to get uh, the self starters okay um, you might have to divide your market vendors into a couple different categories you know those self starters that want to do something versus an experienced vendor I encourage you to work with maybe extension for those winter market meetings a lot of us are willing to come out and do a session, something like we did today, to talk to them about growing. So we want to look at what, who are our vendors in general, what are their learning levels, and try to offer sessions during the winter. I know with a couple of our farmers markets I work with in Ohio, they want nothing to do with policies and bylaws and stuff. They're like, blah, 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 I'm just going to come sell as long as you don't make a rule that's going to prevent me from being a vendor. So we might think about those board meetings versus educational meetings that we're having for our vendors to give them ideas. They're going to come if you're going to give them something that's going to help them not only at your market, but at another market location. Great. And another person is asking, how do you see that men shop differently from, from women? Do you have any insights on that? I, I tend to think men are more of our foodies. I see more and more markets, so they're looking at well, how am I going to cook with this product, I think, more more so than women. Um, men are usually faster shoppers. They're not lingering maybe as long. Uh, they're like, I just need this and I'm out of here. It just depends on the age level of those folks. Um, they might buy differently. A lot of our men that are shopping are usually shopping boomer age that I see. And so they're buying in smaller quantities. So looking at those things about snacking, convenience, um, some, of the, some of the men aren't foodies, and you might have to give them that idea of bundling that here's this package, and it's got everything in it for salsa, and here's the one price for it. So just really convenient. On the, someone has asked here on the scale of, uh, Michael has asked on the scale of things to tackle, how critical is the entertainment factor? I know for me, sometimes I think um, we get too focused on that as, as a thing on the market, rather than looking at our market as a whole to draw people in. That's yeah. That's my personal feeling. And we can spend a lot of money. I'd rather see us spend money on marketing and branding the market and great signage than spending money on entertainment. So really think about what is that entertainment versus for some basic entertainment, can you do different cooking demonstrations or have vendors do these taste test kind of things we talked about with tomatoes? Just some real basic products. It's not going to cost us anything. or Maybe even the market manager could do that. So people are like, oh, I want to taste what the farmer's market's going to have today. And it's not really cooking. It's just a little bit of prep beforehand from a couple of vendors to say, look at these two tomatoes and what do you think the taste difference is? It's also a good way to do your own research and the handouts on page 8 and 9 talk about this. Simple research, thinking about what are consumers saying? Are they saying, gosh, I wish I could do more at the market? Are they saying, you know, I love the cooking demonstration, or boy, that's a waste of time. I don't know why they're doing that. Listen to those customers. Listen to those, yesterday one of the folks mentioned, listen to those small complaints that they're really not complaining about, where they might walk in and say, gosh, it took me 20 minutes to park. And then they turn to be really nice and looking at products out there that you have to offer. Think about those little comments they make. That's the simple research you can do that makes a big difference in the end. But yeah, I agree. Entertainment can be too much of, of a good thing. Uh, what some of the other markets have done, too, is working with like the local chamber or the tourism bureau and let them handle that aspect so that the market doesn't have to worry about it and you can focus on marketing and vendor gap analysis, things like that. Oh, such an excellent point. I, I, I like the idea of using entertainment that's tied into what the market is, as opposed to saying music isn't necessarily about what the market is about, and sometimes can be distracting or even deter conversations between vendor and customer if they can't, if they have to try to talk over the music. And if you remember from the one slide from Easton Farmer's Market where they had that watermelon carving, uh, any kind of a foodie type thing they can do. Uh, you might just have a coloring area for kids that's entertaining for them that they need to color. They can color their favorite vegetable or a blank piece of paper and some crayons. Kids are amazing. 
artist, and you can be like, draw your favorite vegetable. And today is draw your favorite fruit. Uh, maybe there's pumpkin carving that you can do, or somebody's really good at it. Uh, just all those kind of foodie things that can become activities that don't necessarily cost you a bunch, but it also works in with your market. Um, I'm wondering to know if you could address this or not, Eric. It might be a little complex, but about some ways, I think your tools kind of lend to that that you offer today, but how do we understand, and you did talk about it a bit in the presentation, but how do we understand who is shopping at our market? I know for the market I used to manage, um, we happened to be located in an area where we were surrounded by three major pharmaceuticals world headquarters. So there was people now living in the community who were from all over the world. And so it dawned on us by the end of our first season that um, they were looking for stuff that they couldn't find in the grocery store that they were used to eating at home. And so, you know, us as vendors, you know, spend our time all season trying to adapt to that. Like, for instance, I ground lamb became a premium for me. To, to sell because as opposed to a product that wasn't a higher end product, it became a high end product because it was so much in demand because they couldn't find ground lamb very easily in a grocery store. So this comes back to that basic market research. Are we listening to customers at stands? Are we doing little surveys mm -hmm. throughout the year? And it can be probably no more than three to four questions is all you're going to get out of somebody before you're going to annoy them. But uh, getting some folks, uh, even though maybe want to do a 4-H project or a local school that's learning about um, surveying to come and help you ask questions at the market, it can be a big benefit to know that and to know what customers really want. Uh, I know a couple markets that have actually done things like going to the parking lot and writing down the counties, the county numbers in Ohio are on the license plate, and they write that down so they know, like, and they do it like once an hour to know what cars are in a lot, to know what counties they're coming from. So how far are people coming to come to our market? So really they can say, well, we already have a lot of people from X county, so maybe we need to do some marketing in Y county instead. Before um, we have to say goodbye, I just wonder, there's one last question here. Someone asked did, uh, if you had any uh, suggestions for good opening day activities for the market. Opening day is a big challenge, especially if you've been closing all winter. So whatever that extra incentive is, if you can think of who your target market is, this might be the one time when you maybe do have some music or you do have something really special for folks to come to. But again, don't do it on your own. Look at the chamber. Look at the tourism bureau. How can they help you get, that, get those moving along? The other thing you could do is what is your biggest product on opening day? Is it all lettuce? Mm -hmm. Is it all strawberries? What is that product? And maybe if it's all strawberries, you have a strawberry festival. Maybe that links into strawberry smoothies, different strawberry pretzel dessert, different things folks can do with those strawberries and have some kind of a tasting, taste of the season kind of thing. So look at what products uh, you're going to have on that first week and try to maybe build something around the, the, the most product you'll have, and that will help those vendors too because if 10 vendors out of 40 have strawberries. We need to help the vendors sell those strawberries on that day. Good point. And I also think that um, be a, a knowing your, your vendor mix, if it's going to look good on opening day, um, because it's still early in the season, you know, the best part your market's going to look is going to be, of course, in the height of the season. And maybe early in the spring may not be your best showing. And so you may not want to promote it all that much until you actually have uh, better products. But if you have good showing, then then definitely you want to try to get as many people out there as possible. Um, I want to thank uh, Eric Barrett for, for uh, doing this for us today. This, Eric, this was terrific information. And I want to thank you all for attending. And uh, as Liz had posted, there's going to be, uh, we're going to send out a notice to everyone to let you know where there is on the uh, Farmers Market Coalition website um, for, if you, for later viewing or anybody else who wishes to view uh, this and the other webinars in the series. So thank you all very much.